Hello Australia and welcome to another edition of Headlines in Hygiene Air Sampling. We had a few connection problems yesterday, but created a little confusion, but I am now ready to present this transcontinental webinar to my friends and colleagues on the other side of the globe. No worries, mate. I also look forward to seeing many of you at the AIOH conference in Perth later this year. So here are some air sampling topics that I feel are making news in 2015. First is vapor intrusion along with formaldehyde and methanol. So let's start with vapor intrusion or VI for short. US EPA defines vapor intrusion as a migration of volatile chemicals from the subsurface into overlying buildings. I did a course on this subject at the AIOH conference in Canberra, and with a very bad accent, by the way, I described VI as contamination down under. So how does it happen? With VI, volatile chemicals in buried waste or contaminated groundwater emit vapors that migrate through the soil into overlying structures via openings such as cracks in the concrete slab, drains, and pores in concrete blocks. The mechanism is very similar to that of radon gas. Here you can see an illustration of vapor intrusion from US EPA. Chemicals that are dissolved in the groundwater or contained within the soil as a non-aqueous phase liquid emit vapors that permeate through the so-called VEDO zone of the soil where they eventually enter the overlying structure. You know, when I was in Canberra discussing the U.S. EPA guidance document, Someone in the class asked me when, if ever, this EPA document would no longer be just a draft. It was originally published in 2002, but never finalized. Well, now I have some news. At long last, US EPA has released a final VI guidance document in June of this year. It is available on EPA's Vapor Intrusion website at the URL shown on this slide. So let's now take a look at where vapor intrusion typically occurs. Simply put, VI can occur on any site where chemicals have been leaked, spilled, or dumped into the groundwater or soil. Typical sites include old manufacturing sites and dry cleaners, gas stations with leaking underground storage tanks, and landfills and brownfield sites. The predominant toxic vapors found at VI sites are typically chlorinated hydrocarbons and petroleum hydrocarbons. But there can also be explosion hazards at these sites. I remember hearing about a vapor intrusion problem in Melbourne a few years ago, where new houses, brand new houses, were built on top of a former landfill, and they were exploding due to methane. The VI case shown on this slide was very unique and troubling. Mercury vapors were present at toxic levels within a daycare center that was built on the site of a former thermometer factory. More than 30 kids were exposed to toxic mercury vapors. You know, so at the end of the day, VI produces an indoor air concern. That's why we as hygienists are get involved. But it is unique. The source of contaminants is not something brought into the structure for a work or other activity. The source of contaminants is underground. And evaluating the risk of these underground chemicals can be complicated 
by the presence of these same chemicals from other sources. You know, I love the science of vapor intrusion because it is a true crossover area for hygiene, environmental, and engineering professionals. VI measurements will not be just for indoor air. A comprehensive VI study involves measurements in multiple locations and matrices with a multidisciplinary team of experts. Of particular importance, in my view, are the so-called dirt people. <laughs> in this webinar, we are going to focus on what's new in the EPA guidance document as it relates to indoor air sampling at VI sites. On this slide, you can see some of the purposes for sampling noted by EPA. First, to diagnose whether VI is occurring. Next, to determine the presence and level of risk. And finally, to evaluate the effectiveness of controls. US EPA provides some general recommendations for indoor air sampling in their recent document. First, use so-called time integrated sampling methods rather than direct reading instruments such as PIDs for spot checks. Remove other potential indoor air sources or indoor sources of the target chemicals to ensure measured concentrations represent only VI sources of these chemicals and verify that the detection limits of the sampling method can meet the project specifications. EPA also notes some environmental considerations for sampling indoor air. Wind speed and direction, barometric pressure, and rainwater. This honestly was news to me. I never thought about outside environmental conditions when sampling indoor air. For all of these reasons, EPA recommends several rounds of indoor air sampling to address potential variability. Stainless steel canisters have been the traditional sampling device for low-level environmental sampling of VOCs. But now, US EPA is making another recommendation. EPA now suggests that passive diffusive samplers may be a better option. And here's why. Studies show results can be equivalent to canisters. They are less intrusive, more convenient to ship and transport, more economical, and they can often be used for longer sample times than canisters. In fact, both EPA and SKC research indicates that passive samplers with charcoal can be used for sample times of almost one month. This will allow users to better address temporal variability. So where do you place the samplers? EPA suggests that in a typical residential structure, samplers should be placed in the basement or crawl space to indicate a worst case scenario and in the first floor living space to indicate typical exposure levels to occupants. And like with hygiene sampling, the devices should be placed at breathing zone level. Using the same sampling methods and duration, also collect one to two samples outdoors for an indication of background levels. 
The SKC Ultra Passive Sampler was developed for environmental studies such as vapor intrusion. This sampler is available with a choice of sorbents for either thermal desorption or solvent extraction followed by GC analysis. The versatility in the choice of sorbents and analysis provides application for various compounds and concentration levels. Also, the batch housing can actually be reused and refilled by the lab with sorbents for a cost-saving measure. Let's now first look at applications for the ultra sampler using thermal desorption. This technique allows users to measure PPB and even sub-PPB chemical levels for typical sample times of 8 to 24 hours. Longer sample times up to seven days may be designated for some chemicals in the SKC passive sampling guide. For these chemicals, reverse diffusion effects were not evidenced when sampling for extended time periods with sorbents designed for thermal desorption. Analytically note, that the limit of detection is typically around 3 nanograms per sample. Very, very low detection limits. Now let's review sample logistics when using samplers designed for thermal desorption. In general, US EPA and SKC recommend that sorbent samplers be used within 30 days after thermal conditioning. This will ensure that the sorbent stays ultra clean for PPB level VOC measurements. Now I'm sure this 30 day time frame no doubt seems unusual to hygienists. For standard IH sampling of VOCs, sorbent media can be kept for years on the shelf. But this is not the case when you're looking at PPB level sampling with uh, thermal desorption analysis. So it is really critical for users to collaborate with your lab. SKC offers the ultra badge housings empty along with small vials of sorbent with the required amount to fill the badge. In this way, the laboratory can thermally condition the sorbent, load into the badge housing, and ship to you for immediate deployment into the field. SKC provides sorbent vials containing either Anazorb GCB1 and GCB2, which stands for graphitized carbon black. We also provide chromosorb 106 sorbent. Many of us grew up in the profession thinking of 10x as the ultimate sorbent for thermal desorption. But this actually is an older, weaker sorbent and is not really recommended for long-term sampling of 24 hours or more as reverse diffusion may occur with this weaker sorbent. Once you return the ultrasampler to the lab, they will pour the sorbent into a standard thermal desorption tube for thermal desorption of collected compounds followed by GC analysis. Now, if you wanted to do extended sampling for many days or many weeks, activated charcoal is the sorbent of choice. This is the only sorbent that will literally hang on to the collected compounds for such a long period and will not exhibit reverse diffusion. SKC offers the ultra sampler with charcoal for this application and it's available in several options. Pre-filled by SKC with charcoal or user-filled from a sorbent vial 
and the sampler is available with or without a blank section of sorbent. And all of this affects the cost, of course. This slide notes a very, very important consideration for sampling, particularly at VI sites. Indoor air sampling in a fixed location, not on a person, in an area, particularly in an unoccupied house, may have near zero air velocity conditions, and this will impact passive samplers. Specifically, SKC noted that sampling rates may decline as much as 60% when you are in these extreme stagnant air conditions. So if you are sampling under these conditions of less than 5 centimeters per second, use the special sampling rates noted in the URL shown on this slide. The standard uptake rates do not apply when you are in completely stagnant air. When sampling rates were adjusted for low face velocity, SKC noted very close correlation in benzene data at a VI site using canisters and ultra-passive samplers. Note that in all cases, Anazorb GCB1 gave higher results than the old 10X because Anazorb GCB1 has much better adsorptive properties. Okay, now let's move on to a chemical that has definitely made headlines in the U.S. in 2015. In fact, we could call it a formaldehyde blowout, and here's why. U.S. OSHA issued a hazard alert for hair smoothing products, such as the product called Brazilian Blowout. These products were found to release formaldehyde during their normal application in hair salons. And indeed, a NIOSH study indicated that air samples could exceed the ACGIH ceiling limit of 0.3 ppm. But wait, there's more. In March of this year, a TV news show called 60 Minutes reported that laminate flooring from China is releasing formaldehyde into people's homes at alarming levels. This created a, an amazing public health hysteria, as many people watch this TV show on Sunday nights. And believe me, everyone was hopping on that Monday when you're in the, when you're in the field of occupational health and safety. It definitely had health and safety professionals floored. So let's take a look at sampling options for formaldehyde in 2015 and note in particular the advantages, disadvantages, and applications for each. Most of us, again, went to school in the university and kind of grew up sampling formaldehyde using impingers following NIOSH method 3500. I think there's two reasons why people still use this method. It's colorimetric, so even universities, public health labs, they can purchase and use and maintain the spectrophotometers required. But secondly, this is a very sensitive method. In fact, NIOSH says it is the most sensitive formaldehyde method in the manual, with a range down to 0.1 ppm with a 15 liter sample. But nobody likes impingers. They are better suited for area sampling. If you are going to do personal sampling, you will probably want to use another method. There are currently two active sampling methods available using sorbent tubes. And I frequently get questions as to why you would choose one method over the other. 
Now looking at sorbent tube method one, the method of reference are NIOSH methods 2541 and OSHA method 52. This uses XAD2 sorbent coated with HMP hydroxymethylpiperidine. This method is primarily used in industrial applications. It allows the simultaneous collection of formaldehyde and acrolein, which are frequently found together in industrial environments, which was again was news to me. This method eliminates the use of impingers for formaldehyde and overcomes storage stability issues with previous acrolein methods. The working range is down to 0.24 ppm with a 10 liter sample. The second sorbent tube option is referenced in NIOSH, EPA, and ASTM methods. This sorbent used, the sorbent used is silica gel coated with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine. This method allows for the collection of not only formaldehyde, but also other aldehydes and ketones, including the chemical sterilant glutaraldehyde following NIOSH method 2532. This is a very sensitive method that is typically used for indoor air and ambient air sampling. A working range down to 0 0.012 ppm for a 15 liter sample is specified by NIOSH. So let's compare the methods side by side. The DNPH coated silica gel tubes provide lower sensitivity than the HMP coated tubes. And they allow for the collection of other aldehydes and ketones. But only the HMP coated tubes are suitable for the simultaneous collection of formaldehyde and acrolein. It is important to note that the DNPH coated tubes are very sensitive to temperature. Tubes must be stored at 4 degrees C and should be shipped expedited or on a cold pack. Conversely, the HMP chemistry provides excellent storage, even at ambient temperatures. Now, given the low sensitivity of the DNPH chemistry, most passive samplers on the market are based on this concept. The methods of reference include US OSHA 1007. In this method, three brands of passive uh, formaldehyde passive samplers were, were completely validated, including the SKC UMEX 100. The UMEX 100 shown here is very simple to operate. You simply slide the green cover down to start sampling, slide it up to stop sampling. The working range of this device is down to 0 0.06 ppm, and SKC provides sampling rates for other aldehydes. Keep in mind, like DNPH coated tubes, DNPH based passive samplers are sensitive to temperature. Background levels will rise with prolonged exposure to even ambient temperatures. We normally ship expedited or on, we're just with a cold pack. Finally, let's look at formaldehyde in dust. Formaldehyde resins are used as adhesives in particle boards and are added to fabrics for wrinkle resistance. Therefore, workers in these industries can be exposed to dust that slowly release formaldehyde. NIOSH published method 5700 to measure formaldehyde in dust. In this method, dust is collected onto PVC filters using the IOM sampler at 2 liters a minute. The laboratory will then analyze the filter 
using HPLC. Lastly, let's look at another chemical in the headlines, methanol. Historically, methanol has been used in the production of chemicals, including formaldehyde. It's been used as a solvent and antifreeze and to make synthetic resins and to a small degree as a fuel blend in race cars. But in most recent headlines, methanol is being used as an additive to fracking fluids. In this application, methanol serves as a corrosion and scale inhibitor and friction reducer. Now given the growth of fracking in the U.S. and elsewhere, the issue of methanol sampling was brought to SKC chemists for some help and advice. Existing active sampling methods are quite burdensome for users. The NIOSH method has extremely short sample times and sample migration between sorbent layers with storage can be problematic. The OSHA method uses two tubes in series to overcome migration problems, but again, this is cumbersome to assemble and use. This method also has limited sampling times like the NIOSH method. So given the concerns with existing active methods for methanol, SKC chemists developed a new passive sampler that has been validated for use from 15 minutes to 8 hours. The sampler contains Anisorb 747 sorbent in our standard 575 badge housing, but there is something unique to this device. There is an extra snap-on rate reducing cap to ensure that there is no reverse diffusion which can be a problem with methanol. Samplers can be stored at ambient temps for one week or at freezer temps for three weeks before analysis. So this is definitely a much better option than our older active methods. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, again, you can always reach me anytime by using the email skctech at skcinc.com. And I, again, look forward to seeing many of you in Perth at AIOH.